Welcome to Whiskey Cast, cask strength conversation featuring news and interviews from the world of whiskey. I'm Mark Gillespie. This is episode number 802 for January 19th, 2020. This weekend, I'm on the road at the 15th annual Victoria Whiskey Festival in Victoria, British Columbia. We'll have highlights from the festival at the Hotel Grand Pacific coming up later on Whiskey Cast in depth, including this year's Canadian Whiskey Awards winner as Canadian Whiskey of the Year. I'll also have the calendar of events, your voice, the what I'm tasting this week department, and a whole lot more. All on this episode of Whiskey Cast. From far beyond the wall comes a whiskey. For those who face the oncoming storm and never stop walking, winter is here. White Walker by Johnny Walker. White Walker by Johnny Walker. Blended Scotch whiskey, 41.7% alcohol by volume. Imported by Diageo North America, Norwalk, Connecticut. Please drink responsibly. When you land on something special, you just know. Redbreast, the quintessential single pot still Irish whiskey and a proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast. Let's get started with the news. It's brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery. It's been a big week for whiskey industry leaders in Washington. Executives from the Scotch Whiskey Association and other spirits industry trade groups spent most of the week meeting with Trump administration officials. Saturday marked three months since the U.S. imposed a 25% tariff on imports of single malt whiskies from Scotland and Northern Ireland, along with other goods imported from Europe. That tariff was part of a long-running dispute between the U.S. and the European Union over aircraft subsidies for Airbus and Boeing, and we are starting to see the early impact of the tariff as whiskey makers and consumers become collateral damage in the wider trade conflict. Graham Littlejohn is with the Scotch Whiskey Association and says the industry is starting to get a bit nervous. It's a bit too soon to quantify it from a wider market impact, but I can tell you two things. The first is that anecdotally, some of our smaller member companies have said that they have pulled out of the U.S. market altogether. So the 25% tariff is already going to reduce consumer choice in the United States. The second thing I can tell you is some of the preliminary market data which we, we have um, you know, since October. And I can tell you that in the six months running up to when tariffs were implemented, exports to the United States for single malt were up by 20%. So uh, another good year in the United States for exports, of course, after our record year in 2018. In the two months following the implementation of the tariffs in October, uh, exports of Scotch whiskey, single malt Scotch whiskey, fell by 30%. So there has been a huge drop off uh, in the the export of single malt uh, since the tariffs came in. And again, if this continues for six months, a year, then it really uh, takes a challenging situation to what could become a devastating situation for the industry. And that's what we're trying to avoid. And that's a 30% drop year over year? That's a 30% drop in uh, October and November, month on month, uh, compared with the year previously. That's correct. So 2018, of course, was a, a really good year for Scotch whiskey in the United States, both for blended Scotch and for single malt. It was a record year. Uh, but in October and November, we have seen a real drop off in the exports of, of Scotch whiskey, which have gone to the United States. And we don't want to see that continue. So uh, we were, when we were talking to U.S. Uh, officials this week, we're saying during this reevaluation process, which is ongoing at the moment by the USTR, we should strip out the, the, the Scotch whiskey elements from this trade dispute. Of course, we are no part of the dispute which has been ongoing between the United States and the European Union over Airbus subsidies. But also, uh, and we've made this clear to to the United States uh, officials that we are pressing on behalf of the US whiskey industry here in the UK. And we really think that now the UK will be leaving the European Union at the end of uh, January, on the 31st of January, and we go into that implementation period. When we uh, leave that implementation period at the end of 2020, there's a real opportunity to do things differently and to try and find a level playing field between the United States and the UK so we can strip the US whiskey and Scotch whiskey industries out of these unrelated trade disputes. Now you know what my next question is going to be. If there are distilleries and brands that are pulling out of the US, can you tell us which ones they are? I can't go into that detail, no. I mean, companies will make their own commercial decisions 
Um, but of course, all uh, Scotch, all Scotch whisky companies, uh, all distillers who produce single malt will go to the United States. It's been a very stable, important market for the industry for 25 years, uh, and for longer than that, 25 years is the amount of time that it has been zero tariff, and that has really benefited not just Scotch whisky producers of all sizes, but also the U.S. economy in terms of the the distribution network which we use uh, to get single malt and other Scotch whiskies across the country. So uh, I can't tell you which countries are reducing their exports or pulling out of the market altogether, but there has been that impact just in the short two months that it has been since the the, uh, the the implementation of the tariffs on October the 18th, and we want to see those tariffs come off as soon as possible, so these these companies can go back to the U.S. market and give consumers the range of choice which they've been so used to. There's also a lobbying effort led in Europe by the Scotch Whiskey Association and its counterparts to persuade the European Union to remove its 25 percent tariff on imports of American whiskies that went into effect in June of 2018. The latest data compiled by the Distilled Spirits Council shows U.S. whiskey exports to Europe are down by 28% year-over-year. Discus CEO Chris Swanger was in meetings with White House officials this week where they defended the administration's position to take a tough stand with Europe. There is clear recognition and understanding by the Trump administration of the impact and the challenges Uh, these tariffs are having not only on the distilled spirits industry, but a lot of industries are affected by that. But according to them, they're playing long and they believe for national security purposes and a whole variety of purposes that they have to take an aggressive approach and an aggressive posture. And one of the tools that they have in their tool belt is tariffs. And obviously that has created a lot of pain and consternation by our industry. So the challenge that I would like to cite uh, for everybody and your listeners to understand is just based on the feedback and the dialogue that we had this week uh, with uh, leading U.S. government stakeholders is uh, there is a great divide between the U.S. and the EU uh, on, as it relates to our trading relationship. Chris Swanger will be heading to Brussels next week for a similar series of meetings with European Union officials, though they did get a chance to make their case this week to the EU's lead trade negotiator, Ireland's Phil Hogan. It was just by happenstance. Uh, myself and Karen Betts with the Scotch Whiskey Association were having breakfast, just a fun little story. And obviously the the focus of the discussion between Karen and I is, you know, what do we need to do? What can we do more in grappling with the tariff challenges? You know, Washington, D.C. can be a small town and lo and behold, uh, you know, here walks up the lead trade negotiator for the EU and him and his uh, lead negotiating team sat right next to us. So, Obviously, we took the opportunity to introduce ourselves and just convey that we're very invested in trying to uh, play a constructive role with the the EU and the U.S. to try to get an outcome because there's a lot of companies on both sides of the Atlantic uh, that are very, very anxious and uh, are grappling with a lot of pain as a result of this. Swanger sees at least one potential bright spot on the trade front, this week's Senate approval of the U.S.-Mexico-Canada trade agreement and the signing of phase one of a new trade agreement with China may remove some of the pressure on U.S. trade officials and give them more time to work on resolving the differences with the European Union. Now, here's one of those stories that might just turn out to be an isolated instance or potentially a canary in the coal mine, signaling tougher times ahead for the whiskey industry. South Korea has been a key market for whiskey makers for many years, but Scotch whiskey sales there have been slowly declining over the last decade, according to the drinks business. Edrington became the latest Scotch whiskey company to reduce its presence in South Korea and will close its office in Seoul this March. Diageo is planning to close a bottling plant in South Korea, and Pernod Ricard sold off its Imperial Scotch whiskey brand that had been a mainstay in the Korean market. The drinks business cited IWSR data showing a 75% drop in Scotch whiskey sales in South Korea since 2002. One key factor has been the growing popularity of low ABV whiskies 
with younger Korean consumers. Those whiskeys are being seen as healthier than traditional whiskeys, and sales of those whiskeys in South Korea actually surpassed Scotch whiskey sales in 2018. Meanwhile, Nika is still having problems meeting the demand for Japanese whiskeys. The distiller is pulling three more of its age statement blended malts off the market to manage its stocks of aging whiskey. The move will affect the Takatsuru Pure Malt 17, 21, and 25-year-old whiskeys, named in honor of Nika whiskey founder Masataka Takatsuru. Nika will still produce a no-age statement version of Takatsuru Pure Malt, which uses malt whiskeys from both the Yoichi and Miyagikyo distilleries. On that note, Miyagikyo Distillery celebrated its 50th anniversary in 2019, and Nika released a single malt from each of its distilleries to mark the occasion. The Miyagikyo and Yoichi Limited Edition 2019 whiskeys are now coming to the U.S. 70 bottles of each will be available in the U.S. The recommended retail price... $3,500 each. Other whiskeys announced this week. Buffalo Trace is releasing its first batch of Stag Jr. for 2020. As with all of the previous releases since Stag Jr. was introduced in 2013, this one is 8 years old, unfiltered, and uncut. This batch is bottled at 64.2% ABV. There's no word on pricing. Old Forester is making a change to its single barrel program for bars and retailers. The program will now offer buyers a choice of bottling their whiskey at either 50% ABV, 100 proof, or at barrel strength. And the old 45% ABV, 90 proof option is being discontinued. That announcement gives us an example of the difference between bottling at 50% or barrel strength. Given that the barrels are the same size, Old Forester says a barrel that's bottled at 50% should yield around 200 standard size bottles. But if you bottle it at barrel strength, that barrel should only produce around 160 bottles. England's Spirit of Yorkshire Distillery is releasing its second single malt whiskey. Filey Bay's second release is a combination of ex-bourbon barrels and a single sherry cask. 6,000 bottles will be available through the distillery shop and UK retailers. The recommended retail price, £55 a bottle, or about $72 US. The black bottle 10-year-old blended malt disappeared from the market a decade or so ago under Burn Stewart ownership in favor of a no-age statement version. Distel acquired the brand when it bought Burn Stewart several years ago and is now reviving the 10-year-old Black Bottle, but with a change in the blend. Black Bottle 10 traditionally used exclusively single malts from Isla in the blend, but Distel's Mike Brisebois says that is not the case with the new version. Just last week in the UK, we got Black Bottle 10-year, and it's all the Isla malts, including Lechik. So it's if you're a Black Bottle fan, it's available now. So... It's not officially an Isla blended malt anymore because you put the Lechig from Mole in there. That's right, but it's uh, Lechig is great having it in there. It's uh, that extra little peat influence as well, especially from the family of Distel. As of now, there are no official plans to sell the new Black Bottle 10-year-old outside of the UK. And speaking of peat, this week is Peat Week in Seattle. Now, the city's mayor didn't officially declare it as Peat Week, But Seattle's Westland Distillery did. It celebrates Peat Week every January, complete with special events and an annual release. The celebration starts as soon as Westland master distiller Matt Hoffman gets home from Victoria. So this year's Peat Week is um, something we haven't done in a while, which is one single cask. However, this is a puncheon. It's a 500-liter French oak uh, cask. Uh, which is brand new. It's a gamba cask, so an Italian cooper, but French oak. Really interesting flavor profile. So it's really limited. It's 500-some bottles. Uh, But to take that kind of French oak flavor profile plus heavy peat makes this crazy whiskey that we haven't really experienced before. So in other peat week releases, we've been blending casks. This is just back to a single cask, but a single very large cask. And then you'll have the events this coming week at the distillery, right? Yeah, absolutely. So we're doing a cocktail competition, which we've been doing all across Seattle. So Seattle's best bartenders, uh, 
creating peanut whiskey cocktails um, for the patrons of their bar. Coming down, we do a final cocktail competition. Um, each year we do, uh, uh, we call it a symposium, but it's basically a big nerd fest. We're going to talk about the science of peanut or the science of smoking. So this year we're exploring um, smoke in food, especially in the Northwest. We got some of the Pacific Northwest best chefs exploring how smoke is used in dishes while we're drinking our Peat Week release. And then we do our big Peat Week blowout party on the Saturday where we actually release the whiskey um, fun and games happening that day. Um, you know, we'll have hundreds of people through. So uh, same thing, you know, same basic concept we do every year, but try to do something new, give people a new excuse to come down. Now, since it's limited, it'll only be sold at the distillery, right? That's correct. Yeah, we're keeping the Pete Week thing pretty tight this year. Again, because we only have a little bit of it, uh, we couldn't spread it out too much. We were just so obsessed with this cask. Um, we just couldn't spread anything beyond the distillery's walls. This is just sort of a warm-up for the big event next month when you guys host the World Whiskey Forum. Yeah, we're really excited about the World Whiskey Forum. I mean, this is we're going to have some of the, the greatest whiskey producers from around the world uh, coming together to talk about uh, the future of whiskey. And that's, that's an incredible thing to have such open dialogue amongst producers, big and small, all talking about where whiskey is headed, where it should be headed, maybe where it shouldn't be headed. And to have that debate be open in front of people in films, uh, that's, that's going to be an incredible thing. We were so happy to be part of it for the past two conferences. Really honored to host it. Uh, and we're excited to show the world what this is going to look like. And this is the first time it's been held in the U.S. It's been in Sweden the last couple of years, right? So the first year was Sweden. Last year was at Cotswolds Distillery in the U.K. So, yeah, first time getting out of Europe. Uh, but it's a big jump. Again, we're going to have distillers from Europe, from Asia, from Japan, you know, everybody coming across. Uh, so it'll be a good group of people. Uh, and we're excited to kind of showcase something different. We're going to be showcasing American distillers. We've got American panelists. Uh, again, it's not just single malt. We've got um, panelists from bourbon, panelists from rye. So it's going to be a bigger, kind of more inclusive World Whiskey Forum. By the way, the World Whiskey Forum is February 17th and 18th, and we'll have coverage next month right here on WhiskeyCast. It's now been two years since British Columbia liquor inspectors raided the four Scotch Malt Whiskey Society partner bars in Victoria, Vancouver, and Nanaimo. They seized all of the Society whiskeys from those bars, on the grounds that the bars violated regulations requiring them to buy all of their inventory directly from B.C.'s Provincial Liquor Agency. One case is still outstanding. Eric and Allura Fergie of Fett's Whiskey Kitchen in Vancouver have appealed their case to the British Columbia Supreme Court after the province's liquor regulators ruled against them. That appeal was filed in late October, but the Ministry of the Attorney General has not yet filed its briefs in the case. The Society's Canadian chapter returned to the Victoria Whiskey Festival this year after skipping last year as a protest. Eric Fergie outlined their case to consumers during the Society's grand tasting Thursday night. Our lawyers filed a constitutional question uh, regarding the, the breach of the charter, and that was done last week. And the government has assured us that January 31st they will respond to our, uh, our suit. And we're waiting. For those who are not familiar with the Canadian process, define constitutional question. What did you do? So the government, uh, in our opinion, our, our lawyer's opinion, our opinion, that they, uh, they breached the charter. So our charter of rights and freedoms, uh, the, the government actors should have issued uh, my wife, my partner, Allura, a charter caution. And a charter caution would be like your Miranda rights. Anything you say, we'll use it against you, etc. And she actually asked them, do I have time to call my lawyer? And they said no. So that's uh, so the breach of charter, Section 8, is uh, search and seizure. And without a warrant, that's where we stand. Could they respond by, oh, say, showing 242 empty bottles on the courthouse lawn or something like that? Uh, that would make some good, uh, some good media coverage, but uh, they actually have the opportunity to look at it and go, you know, this isn't going to carry any water. We should walk it back, which they should have done at the beginning. Uh, when it's dealing with a, a government using taxpayers' money, yeah, likely that's not the case. Spokesmen for B.C.'s Ministry of the Attorney General have not commented on the FETS appeal, citing a policy against discussing pending litigation. Finally, with the 100th anniversary of Prohibition this past Friday, here's a reminder that if you happen to own an older house, 
It just might be worth checking the nooks and crannies when you're doing renovation work. Tracy Bozen and Kevin Michael have been renovating their Pendleton House bed and breakfast in Pendleton, Oregon. The East Oregonian newspaper reports that last week, a contractor was clearing space to install new insulation when he found a burlap bag that clinked when he moved it. He looked inside and found 10 bottles of Comet Bottled and Bond whiskey distilled back in 1913. Not all of the bottles were full, and according to the paper, one was full of sediment. Now, it's not the first time that they've found old whiskey stashed in the house. Back in 2016, they were removing a built-in chest of drawers when they found a hidden compartment. Inside, three bottles of Teacher's Highland Cream Scotch, wrapped in a newspaper from 1930. They may open up some of that whiskey one day, but do not plan to sell it. Tracy Bozen told the newspaper, These are treasures that belong to the house. You can keep up on the latest whiskey news all week long at whiskeycast.com. The news is brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery. Larceny Bourbon's heritage goes back to the days when Treasury agent John E. Fitzgerald was patrolling the Rick Houses of Kentucky, not just for the feds, but also for himself. He was stealing a taste of some of his favorite barrels of weeded bourbon on the side. Today's award-winning Larceny Bourbon has that same soft, smooth character Fitzgerald loved. Look for 92-proof Larceny Bourbon at your local retailer, and be on the lookout for the new limited edition release of Larceny Barrel Proof. Find out more at HeavenHillDistillery.com. Think wisely, drink wisely. Time now for the Whiskey Cast calendar of events. We have a lot of Burns Night events around the world over the next 10 days or so. You'll find the latest updates on our calendar at the Whiskey Cast website. Tickets are still available for Thursday night's kickoff of the Kentucky Derby Museum's Bourbon Masters Series for 2020 with Peggy No Stevens in Louisville. The National Whiskey Festival is this coming Saturday in Glasgow, Scotland, along with a whiskey school at Cork and Cask in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Hansa Spirit 2020 is January 30th through February 2nd in Hamburg, Germany, and the Whiskey Global is in Vancouver, British Columbia, on January 31st and February 1st, along with Whiskey Live in Bangkok, Thailand, on those same dates. Finally, the Malt Mania Summit is February 2nd in Tokyo. Right now, we have 293 different events around the world on our searchable calendar at whiskeycast.com. If you have a festival, a tasting, or any other whiskey-related event coming up, just use the contact form at whiskeycast.com to let us know about it, and we'll add it to the list. The search never ends, but it's nice when you can come in for a landing. Pause and explore the silky smoothness of single pot still Irish whiskey, matured in the finest bourbon and Oloroso sherry casks. Land on Redbreast, then be sure to pass it on. Proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast. Whiskey Cast in Depth is brought to you by Mortlock. Once again, I'm on location this week at the Victoria Whiskey Festival in Victoria, British Columbia. The festival is celebrating its 15th anniversary this year, and there was also another milestone at the festival, the 10th anniversary of the Canadian Whiskey Awards. The awards dinner has become the traditional kickoff for the Victoria Whiskey Festival, and for the last couple of years, it's usually been a big night for the folks at Corby's Hiram Walker Distillery in Windsor, Ontario. For the third straight year, Hiram Walker was named Canadian Whiskey Distillery of the Year. For the second straight year, Dr. Don Livermore was named the Canadian Whiskey Blender of the Year. And this year, his Pike Creek 21-year-old Oloroso cask finish was named the Canadian Whiskey of the Year. So you hit the trifecta tonight. Yes, and I, I, I can't 
explain how, how grateful that we feel. Certainly, there's 350 people at our distillery uh, and certainly people inside our marketing and sales department all across Canada. It is a team effort to make whiskey, and I can't explain that enough as, as the ones we won Whiskey of the Year. It's a great feeling, and, I, and it, it takes a team to make our whiskeys uh, and our brands. What was going through your mind when Devin was announcing all three of them for you and your team? Unbelievable, to, to be honest with you. I, I, I didn't expect this whiskey to win the Whiskey of the Year. I knew it was something I've been playing with for a long time, uh, and I knew it was, it was a great-tasting whiskey, and I'm glad the judges and the Canadian whiskey experts in our industry uh, uh, chose it as the Whiskey of the Year. It's a fantastic achievement. Again, I can't, can't say enough about all the people that work for us that, uh, that make our whiskey. It, it's an honor and a great feeling. How do you top it for next year? I'm doing a whiskey tomorrow night at our grand tasting that uh, I actually adore a little bit more than the whiskey of the year. Uh, and it is involves Pike Creek. As you know, I love doing barrel finishings. I love doing things around what whiskey barrels can provide to whiskey. And I think this one may, uh, may be a little bit better. But uh, I, I'd love to see your feedback tomorrow night, Mark. That whiskey he's talking about is a 21-year-old Pike Creek finished in Pedro Jimenez sherry casks. It's likely to be released this fall when Corby unveils its annual special releases for J.P. Weiser's, Pike Creek, Lot 40, and Goodrum and Wurtz. And, by the way, it is pretty good, but I'll wait to share my tasting notes until it's been officially released. Full disclosure, Lot 40 is a WhiskeyCast sponsor, and for the 10th straight year, I served as a judge in this competition, All of the samples are judged blindly by a panel of judges led by Canadian Whiskey Awards founder Davin DeCurgamo. Since the judging panel operates in silence until after the awards are announced, I didn't have a chance to discuss the competition with Davin until Thursday night. Interesting competition this year, wasn't it? It was very, very different. Yeah, it was really quick. The thing is, the quality just keeps going up and up and up, so it gets more and more... Uh, difficult assessing, you know, which whiskey's uh, going to win. And I, I, Pike Creek was a surprise for me, I have to say, until I tasted it. It's a really wonderful, wonderful whiskey. And, uh, the, they've really done a great job on that, yeah. As one of the judges, I know I found it hard to get a whiskey that stood out from all the others just because they're all so good this year. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I'm just thinking that the cutoff between a gold medal and a Silver medal was like about four points. It was that tight. So yeah, it, it, it was, of course they want to win, so they send their good stuff. But uh, yeah, it's a very very uh, tight competition this year. But I think also that we're having a lot more distilleries who are really stepping up to the plate to make really high quality whiskeys. I mean that Alberta Premium. You know, when we've seen a couple of great ones from them, but we've seen a lot of whiskey that's. You know, great drinking, but it's not connoisseur quality yet. And then, then they come up with this stuff, which just blew our minds, you know. How hard was it to determine those distillery uh, and blending team and all the uh, the decade awards this year after 10 years? It wasn't very difficult at all, to be quite honest with you. Once you sat down and sit down and look at what, what's happened over the last 10 years in the Canadian Whiskey Awards, uh, really uh, two things popped out of there. Forty Creek, Forty Creek, Forty Creek, Forty Creek and um, Alberta distillers. Now, in recent years, we've seen a lot more coming from Hiram Walker, but if you look over the whole decade, Forty Creek really kind of has it. Davin unveiled a special series of awards for the 10th anniversary. Forty Creek founder John Hall was named the Canadian Whiskey Maker of the Decade, and Forty Creek's Confederation Oak was named the Canadian Whiskey of the Decade. But the award for Canadian Whiskey Distiller of the Decade went to Beam Centauri's Alberta Distillers in Calgary. Not just for its own Alberta premium whiskeys, but for creating rye whiskeys that led to Whistlepig Rye, Masterson's, Canadian Club 100% Rye, and other award-winning whiskeys. Beam Centauri Canadian Marketing Director Pat Sweeney accepted the award, and as he told me after the ceremony... We'll be seeing a lot more from Alberta distillers in the very near future. Alberta Distillers, Distillery of the Decade. Did you even see that one coming? Not at all, but super proud. 
Um, obviously, uh, the folks at Alberta Stores do some great work, and it's, it's unbelievable to get recognized for it. Um, and there's a lot of amazing things to come as well. Um, you know, as we look forward to the future, is we're going to continue to innovate um, and deliver some really amazing whiskeys. And, uh, you know, from my perspective, we have an amazing like history, uh, most recent, um, but there's, there's greater things to come. So very excited about that and really honored with the recognition, absolutely. And your whiskeys have sort of been very underrated over the years because uh, not a lot of folks know about Alberta distillers in Calgary, but when you came out with Alberta Premium Cask Strength in 2019 and the 20-year-old, that sort of uh, revived interest in this brand, didn't it? It, absolutely. So the uh, Alberta Premium 100% Rye regular offering, unbelievable brand, a uh, lot of consumer loyalty for it. The opportunity that we've had in the past where we've launched some, we've launched 30-year-olds, um, you know, garnered some interest, which is really interesting. And that's what really drove the thought process around cast strength and bringing back an aged spirit was 20-year-old. And, uh, you know, we're excited for the future and what that's going to mean. But I think ultimately at the distillery with the team that's working there and some of the finishes that we're looking at, uh, some of the uh, opportunities we have to innovate in the future, very excited about that. Might we see Alberta Premium come south of the border? That is something um, I wouldn't be surprised to see. And uh, it's only fair to share some of the great products from Alberta still is with our friends in the U.S. How soon? Uh, I would say ultimately 2020, 2021, there'll probably be some opportunities that we're going to see in the U.S., we're definitely going to try. We think this is something that we shouldn't just keep for the Canadian domestic market. It's something that we should share worldwide. So we're going to look forward to that opportunity. Wild on Livermore won the award as Canadian Whiskey Blender of the Year. The Lifetime Achievement Award went to an entire team of blenders, Diageo's Crown Royal Blending Team based in Montreal. Crown Royal's Stephen Wilson accepted the award for the blending team. One of the things that I'm always so humble to do, Mark, is to, to represent our team both in Gimli and in Montreal. And when I look at what our blending team has accomplished and what they've taught me, it's just such a privilege to be able to, to speak on their behalf. And when I think about just the love that Joanna Scandella and Mark Balkanenda and the entire team in Montreal has not only given all of us as whiskey connoisseurs, uh, but that they're willing to share with all of us the, the knowledge they've been able to teach me it's such a privilege tonight to be able to walk up there and accept that award on their behalf, and I can't wait to send them the email or call them tomorrow to share the good news. Other major award winners, Alberta Premium's 20-year-old and Cask Strength Editions, won the Award of Excellence for Best Line Extension, while the award for Best New Whiskey went to Great Plains Brandy Cask 18-year-old. The Award of Excellence for Innovation went to Bareface 111 Oaxaca, and Ottawa's North of Seven Distillery, was named the Artisanal Distillery of the Year. We'll post a link to the complete list of winners in our show notes for this episode at whiskeycast.com. Of course, there's a lot more to the Victoria Whiskey Festival. Three days of tastings, more than 40 master classes, and whiskeys from all over the world and close to home. British Columbia, for instance, is now home to more than 60 distilleries, Divine Distillery in Saanich, just north of Victoria, won a special award for its Ancient Grains Whiskey Spirit. Since it's matured for just over a year in quarter size casks, it can't officially be called Canadian whiskey. Ken Winchester and Kevin Titcom make it from malted barley and four so-called ancient grains, spelt, emmer, einkorn, and corasan. It's given them a way to have something on the market, while maturing their Glen Saanich single malt. How hard was it to come up with the grains for ancient grains, and why did you do it in the first place? We like to sort of experiment uh, with different things, number one. Uh, so as a bookend to our single malt, we want to do something very different. Uh, and we also uh, have a lot of different uh, grains available to us in, in B.C., so we took a look from a historical perspective at what some of these uh, heritage, unmodified ancestors of modern grains were and literally just decided to experiment with some so we we picked four of the heritage grains and uh, blended that with the malted barley and and just went with it so, so let's go through those grains uh, what were they and what flavors did they bring and what did you learn from it 
So really, f- flavor uh, is is what they bring to the table. So there's spelt, which a lot of people have heard of in, in a baking context. Uh, uh, spelt, emmer, einkorn, and corasan, which is uh, uh, the same thing as kamut or kamut. So what you get with some of these grains, the corasan especially, it's a very hard grain, brittle grain. So you get a lot of sort of a nuttiness. Uh, the emmer and einkorn bring a bit of a roasted flavor, but they're also ancestors to wheat, so there's a bit of a sweetness there as well. Um, and, and so I think it's just a different flavor profile that the combination of those grains bring in conjunction with the barley. Yeah. Is this something that other artisan distillers or craft distillers could do in their regions to try to uh, come up with something that's different than a traditional single malt or a traditional whiskey? Absolutely. There's no reason that they couldn't. Um, uh, different grains might do grow differently or better in different areas across the country, but there's no reason that you can't try and extract your your region's flavor out of out of different grains. And I think it's a great way to showcase your area. Um, all of these things are grown in our province, and now even more locally that we're growing some of them. So there's no reason that that other distillers could. We haven't heard of anyone using the those four heritage grains that we've actually used in our mash bill. Uh, it's definitely a unique sort of one of a kind. But absolutely, and I think there are other distillers that are starting to experiment, and you're going to start to see more and more of that happening. And one of the things it gave you was a whiskey spirit, since it's this Ancient Grains is not three years old. It's about a little over a year. But what it did was give you something that can hold up against other whiskeys at just after a year of maturation. That's correct. Um, so, again, the barrel size played into the to the barrel aging duration. With the quarter cast size barrel, we didn't want to over-oak it. It allows us to get it out into bottle a lot quicker, too. Um, but a lot of people want a three-year ancient grains. Uh, they've asked uh, quite a bit. So we are we are fit working that into our program with a larger new oak barrel size to, uh, to bring out a, a true ancient grains whiskey. So this might also work as an alternative for startup distillers, small craft distillers, who need to get a product out quickly but maybe don't want to make gin or vodka. Absolutely. And, you know, that's that's... That wasn't necessarily intended with the ancient grains for us, but it's definitely a nice byproduct that while the single malt library is aging, we're able to turn this around in a year and keep it on the shelf. So um, as long as you're open and honest about the fact that, that it's not three years, it's not technically a whiskey, which we are, then there's no reason other people can't do that. Ancient Grains is available as a standard bottling, and a cask strength version is available through the Strath in Victoria. By the way, they are maturing batches of ancient grains in full-size barrels to make future releases that are three years old and can legally be called Canadian whiskey. The festival also serves as the kickoff for this year's Drams for Fams charity campaign. We've talked a lot about Drams for Fams before. It was started several years ago by the Edmonton Scotch Club as a way to raise money for their local food bank, and it's caught on with whiskey clubs around North America. Travis Watt was one of the founders of Drams for Fams. So what's the goal for Drams for Fams for 2020? Well, 2020, we've uh, reached out to all the clubs that have participated so far, and we're really trying to get each club to try and reach out and bring another club on that will maybe host an event locally in their town and just increase the number of clubs that are participating. We'd also really like to get a club in Europe somewhere just to expand over the we're in North America right now but it'd be really nice to get a club in Europe taking part just to kind of get across the ocean. How many clubs do you have already? Uh, Over the years we've had 19 different clubs participate. This year we had 13 events in 12 cities and uh, like I said we'd like to get that up to hopefully 30 by this year but 25 would be nice as well. And tell us again what Drams for Fams does with the various local charities that you work with. So Drams for Fams started in Edmonton as a fundraiser for the Edmonton Food Bank. And as we started to reach out outside of Edmonton for uh, different clubs to join, we basically found out that other clubs wanted to raise money for local charities that were important to them. So Drams for Fams is whiskey clubs hosting whiskey tastings and raising money for charities in their cities or towns. Um, it's basically just do what you're doing, but raise a little bit of money and make a donation to a charity. So it's moved past just doing fundraising for the food banks to uh, whatever is needed in a local community, right? Exactly. Food bank was important to us for, for many different reasons. 
but other clubs had charities that were important to them. And the one thing we, we definitely noticed is if a charity is important to you, you're going to work harder to raise more money, and that's most important. And in the grand scheme of things, clubs raising money for charities, it doesn't matter what charity is. It's the idea that whiskey drinkers getting together and trying to make a difference, that's kind of the most important part. Where can people find out more information? Everything's on the website. It's www.drams4fams.com. You can actually go on there and see all the different chapters, and you can actually make donations to each of the different clubs, charities of choice, just by clicking on the link right on the website. So even if you're not going to participate in an event, you can still donate to that charity in that town. We'll post a link to the Drams for Fams website in our show notes at whiskeycast.com. Right now, I'm joined at the bar here at the Hotel Grand Pacific by Frank Hudson, one of the directors for the Victoria Whiskey Festival. Frank, tell me what made this year's festival so special, the 15th anniversary. Wow. I, I think every year just gets better and better and better. Um, what makes it so special is the volunteers who come together to put it on and uh, the people who come. Everybody in the community of whiskey here is, is phenomenal. And Victoria really has a strong whiskey community. You don't really have to worry about bringing in people from outside, do you? Uh, no, Victoria actually has the strongest, one of the, I would say, the strongest whiskey community in Canada, to tell you the truth. We've got some people here who I would consider the royalty of the whiskey world, um, who have done a great job of informing people about um, the wonderful world of whiskey. But this festival does draw people in from literally Europe and all over the world, right? Yes, we have people that come from all over the world, from I think probably nine countries this year, like that, uh, from the distillery perspective. It's been phenomenal. How do you top this next year? <laughs> well, what we do once the festival's over, of course, we do a debrief. What can we do better? What went right? What went wrong? And um, we've got some great suggestions for next year. How have you coped, and I know this is a sensitive question, but how have you coped with the issues with uh, the regulators here over the last couple of years, given uh, the approach that the province takes? Do you know, um, the reality of the situation is, is that B.C. has the second most liberal liquor laws in Canada. And, you know, it, that gets lost sometimes. I think it's really a case of working with the regulators to make change. Uh, as a former government employee, change is slow when it comes to government. Change will come, but it will be slow. And it's not really affected in many ways your ability to do this festival each year. No, it hasn't. And they have made a couple of minor tweaks, which actually have helped a lot in terms of getting some of the product that we get at the festival. In terms of what? Well, just in terms of, of um, when they bring product in for the festival, um, they can use that product now for a, a, a longer period of time and use it for the year rather than just for a particular event, which helps them a lot because uh, in my understanding is that when, a, when an agent brings something in for the festival, they have to bring six bottles and they have to bring a case in, which is a lot of whiskey to bring in for, for one event, but now they can use it at other events for the year. Let's get to a happier subject now. Um, what have you guys learned from this that other festival organizers could learn from if, uh, if they were of a mind to? Well, first of all, we're a volunteer-run festival, so um, it, it takes an awful lot of hard work, but um, we're totally different than a for-profit festival, for example, um, and we all come together to do it because we love to do it. You get a bunch of like-minded people who have a love for whiskey and a love to share the, that community um, who go, come together to do it. And basically, we've had the same people doing it for, with very few changes for 15 years. Frank, thank you again for uh, having me here this year and for having our audience here. Uh, we love coming out here. This is one of the highlights of the year, period. Even though it starts in January, it's still one of the highlights of the entire year. And thanks again. Well, just to correct you, it actually starts tomorrow for next year's <laughs> so <laughs> just ask Lawrence that <laughs> but uh, we're happy to have all of you here we're proud we're proud of the festival but more than that we're proud of our city we're proud of where we live and we're proud to host everybody thank you again Frank now if this festival sounds like something you'd be interested in coming to next year you're going to have to do a little advance planning the 2021 Victoria Whiskey Festival will be January 14th through the 17th and tickets sell out practically as soon as they go on sale the first Saturday of November at the Strath. 
But if you're coming in from out of town for the festival, the Hotel Grand Pacific sells ticket and hotel packages starting the day before. Full details will be available later this year at the Victoria Whiskey Festival website. And once again, I'd like to thank Festival Chairman Lawrence Graham, along with Frank Hudson, Ian Huey, and the entire team of directors and volunteers who make this event possible for their hospitality once again this year. As always, full editorial control over this episode remains with WhiskeyCast. That's WhiskeyCast In-Depth, brought to you by Mortlock, whiskey's best-kept secret. Hidden away for decades in some of the world's most famous Scotch whiskeys comes a single malt inspired by an original for a fortunate few. Discover the entire Mortlock lineup at malts.com. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Sagamore Spirit. Let's start off with this year's Canadian Whiskey of the Year in the Canadian Whiskey Awards. The Pike Creek 21-year-old Oloroso cask finish from Hiram Walker Distillery. It's bottled at 45% ABV. The nose is aromatic with dried fruits, figs, brown sugar, and caramel with a good oakiness, along with gentle spices, vanilla, and a hint of nuttiness. The taste has good spicy notes of clove and peppercorns, balanced by honey, vanilla, and hints of toffee and creme brulee in the background. The finish is good and long with lingering spices and touches of almonds, honey, and toffee. I'm scoring the Pike Creek 21-year-old Oloroso cask finish a 94. Last time around, I mentioned a new rye whiskey from Latitude Beverage, but I made a slip-up. I called it Wheelhouse Rye, but it is actually Wheel Horse Rye. It's distilled at the O.Z. Tyler Distillery in Owensboro, Kentucky, and it's bottled at 50.5% ABV. The nose has good touches of baking spices, along with a hint of dill, honey, vanilla, and some caramel. The taste has those same baking spices, balanced nicely by honey, molasses, a touch of dill, caramel, and a hint of oak. The finish, long and spicy with a subtle sweetness and oak in the background. I'm scoring the Wheel Horse Rye Whiskey an 89. I'll have more tasting notes in just a minute. But first, this week's tasting notes are brought to you by Sagamore Spirit Rye Whiskey. Rye whiskey was distilled by America's original risk takers and history makers. Those first barrels of whiskey were bold, flavorful, and full of passion. Sagamore Spirit proudly picked up the torch with their spring-fed Maryland-style rye whiskey. It celebrates the grit and glory of those patriotic ancestors who sipped their way into American history. Visit sagamorespirit.com to explore their award-winning spirit. Before I flew out to Victoria, I received a sample of the latest Black Art release from Brook Laddie. Adam Hennett's Black Art 1994 is 25 years old, and as with all of the Black Art releases, everything else except for the 49.4% ABV is a secret. The nose has notes of figs, dates, dark fruits, licorice, and hints of brandy, anise, and oak tannins. The taste has a thick and oily mouthfeel with plums and raisins at first. Clove and allspice notes come alive slowly, but never overpower the sweet fruity notes of plums, raisins, orange marmalade, and honey. The finish starts off smooth and gentle, but the spices return to complement good fruitiness and a subtle touch of oak. I'm scoring the Brook Laddie Black Art 1994 and 95. Here in Victoria, I had the chance to taste the second release in Beaumore's Vault Edition series that highlights specific elements that contribute to Beaumore's whiskeys from the vault's number one warehouse at the distillery. This one is named Peat Smoke. It's bottled at 50.1% ABV. The nose is waxy with touches of honeycomb and beeswax, along with a gentle hint of peat smoke and touches of brine and smoked salmon. The taste is peppery with a good smokiness and hints of heather, smoked salmon, honey, and vanilla. The finish fades away gently with lingering pepperiness and subtle touches of smoke and brine. I'm scoring the Beaumore Vault Edition Peat Smoke a 92. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Sagamore Spirit Rye Whiskey. 
I'll be adding these tasting notes to our searchable list of nearly 2,800 different whiskeys from all over the world. Check it out this week at whiskeycast.com. From deep in the north, far beyond the wall, the howl of the frozen wind brings word of something new. A whiskey from the land of always winter. For those who face the oncoming storm and never stop walking. Winter is here. White Walker by Johnny Walker. White Walker by Johnny Walker. Blended Scotch whiskey, 41.7% alcohol by volume. Imported by Diageo North America, Norwalk, Connecticut. Please drink responsibly. Time now to open up the inbox for Your Voice, presented by Lot 40. Last time around, we discussed the impact of climate change on farmers who grow the crops used in making whiskey with Dr. Chad Lee of the University of Kentucky College of Agriculture. He tweeted a follow-up comment to us this week after the podcast dropped. Thanks for the conversation. I should have mentioned that a lot of the corn and wheat grown for bourbon is grown in crop rotations of corn, wheat, and double crop soybeans, all in no tillage. Wheat grows in the winter, provides soil protection like a cover crop, but makes grain. About 38% of our corn crop is planted to wheat in the fall. Rye is a popular cover crop after a soybean harvest. Would be nice to make it a cash crop. It would provide soil protection benefits and be another grain grown locally for bourbon. Chad, thank you for following up with us on that. We also heard from Dan Brown in Taipei, Taiwan on Facebook. This has been a topic I've been mentioning to the folks I meet in the whiskey business. I keep hearing all of these sunny predictions for whiskey's continued growth, and when I mention climatic and political pressures on grain supplies, they don't seem too concerned. That surprises me. Looking forward to listening to the episode. You may have seen some of our conversation on Twitter over the last few days after I posted a photo of a new whiskey from Sazerac, Sheepdog Peanut Butter Flavored Whiskey. Now, we are a sheepdog-loving family, but this is where I draw the line. Had lots of fun comments, though. Fellow whiskey writer Jason Horn at Messy Epicure tweeted this, Even if it's only 70 woof? Oy. Longtime listener Scott Rogers chimed in from Wisconsin. That was my attitude, too, until a bottle was passed around the table at a curling tournament, and darned if it isn't by far the best flavor of flavored whiskey. It begs to have a whole new class of cocktails built around it. Sounds awful, but isn't. From at Spec Monkey, I thought cupcake flavored vodka was the bottom. Apparently not. Along with what's next? Kale flavored whiskey? Don't give them any ideas, guys. Rebel Runner Girl on Twitter, I would like to report a crime. This is the crime. With a couple of face palming emojis added. Richard McKeend, the Dram Clan on Twitter, tweeted, Salmon-flavored vodka from Alaska sound any better? Along with a photo of Alaska Distillery's smoked salmon-flavored vodka. Well, I suppose that might actually help a vodka, but keep in mind that there are some single malt scotch whiskeys that do have a hint of smoked salmon, especially some of the Isla malts. I mentioned one just a couple of minutes ago. And United States of Dramerica responded with a photo of a label of Howler Head banana-flavored bourbon with the comment, Banana any better? Well, banana is one of those flavors that can be produced naturally in a whiskey during fermentation and can be found in many whiskeys. I'll admit I'm not a big fan of flavored whiskeys, but as long as the added flavoring doesn't overwhelm the whiskey's natural flavors and aromas, that's fine. Too many flavored whiskeys blow out the natural flavors when they should be an accent. If you have something you'd like to share with whiskey lovers around the world, you can always find us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter at WhiskeyCast, or just email us. The address is comments at WhiskeyCast.com. Your voice is presented by Lot 40, Canada's 100% pot still rye whiskey. Lot 40, unapologetically Canadian. Please drink responsibly. 
Let's close out the show now with Behind the Label, our look at the history, science, and the other things that all combine to make whiskey unique. It's brought to you by Writer's Tears. Let's say you wanted to start a new whiskey brand. Well, you'd probably hire a team of marketing experts, maybe a design consultant for the bottle, and then, of course, you'd need a whiskey maker to figure out just what to put in that bottle. At most whiskey companies, the last thing you'd probably do is listen to a suggestion from one of the rank-and-file workers that spends their time putting labels on bottles. When Proximo Spirits released the Sexton Irish Single Malt a couple of years ago, the obvious thinking was that the company picked that first option. But when Jared Bowler joined Proximo recently as a brand ambassador for Canada, representing Bushmills and the Sexton, which is made at Bushmills, he found out the real story during his training at the distillery. There's only a little over 100 people that work there, and they're all heirlooms of their their families, and, you know, their families' families worked there for a long time and whatnot, and, you know, Sexton was in our portfolio, you know, so they're like, well, how about we let you spend an afternoon with Alex, right? And Alex is just, uh, you know, a charming uh, little Irish lady, you know, that's worked at Bushmills for, I think it was eight or nine years at the time, she said, and... um, you know, her grandmother had passed away, and she apparently was the best pastry chef in all of Ireland, right? And she would she would sip on, on sherry and put a little sherry in her pastry. And then, in addition to that, one of her favorite coopers, one of her favorite people at the distillery, uh, he enjoyed uh, Blackbush, which is, you know, has Oloroso sherry uh, as the primary aging barrels uh, in it. And uh, he had ended up passing away around the same time as her grandmother. So she piped up and, and spoke to Colm and about this idea. And she had an idea to take, uh, as an ode to the Cooper and her grandmother, uh, some of those beautiful Oloroso sherry barrels we use and just age our single malt in it for, uh, you know, up to four or five years. And, you know, the end product being the sexton, um, you know, and then the bottle, you know, she told me it's black and you know, a lot of uh, bottles of whiskey are clear, but she said she wanted it to be a complete sensible experience. You know, the first time you see it in the glass, the first time you smell it and taste it. So, um, it's just uh, kind of this uh, ominous black bottle that's shaped like the Giants Causeway rocks and, you know, just a, a beautiful story. And it's amazing that Bushmills, they are a big family there and they allowed Alex to do this, you know. And she came up with the name too, right? Yep. The Sexton. Yep. Yep. Being the, uh, the, the, the grave digger in Gaelic. So, yeah, pretty uh, pretty amazing stuff. Jared Bowler says Alex now has her own corner of a warehouse with sherry barrels destined for future bottlings of the Sexton. That leaves us with just two questions. One, why didn't someone on the marketing side see the potential in this story all along? And two, did she at least get a raise for coming up with the idea? By the way, you'll find my tasting notes for the Sexton at the WhiskeyCast website. And if you have something you'd like us to look at on a future episode, just use the contact form at whiskeycast.com to get in touch with us. Behind the Label is brought to you by Writer's Tears. Writer's Tears Copper Pot, an 18th century style of premium Irish whiskey, blended from single pot still and single malt. Like yourself, it's one of life's treasured rarities, and what's rare is wonderful. Writer's Tears Copper Pot. That's all for this edition of Whiskey Cast from the Victoria Whiskey Festival. You'll find links for the stories in this episode in our show notes at whiskeycast.com. That's also where you'll find links for our Whiskey Cast HD videos and the Whiskey Cast Tasting Panel podcast, along with the latest whiskey news, my tasting notes, the calendar of events, the whiskey photo of the week. And, of course, a complete archive of all of our past episodes going back to 2005. We love to hear from you. Get in touch with us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at WhiskeyCast. The email address is comments at WhiskeyCast.com. When you land on something special, you just know. Redbreast, the quintessential single pot still Irish whiskey and a proud sponsor of WhiskeyCast. From far beyond the wall comes a whiskey for those who face the oncoming storm and never stop walking. Winter is here. White Walker by Johnny Walker. White Walker by Johnny Walker. Blended Scotch whiskey, 41.7% alcohol by volume. Imported by Diageo North America, Norwalk, Connecticut. Please drink responsibly. 
Whiskey Cast is a production of Cask Strength Media, copyright 2020, and usually comes to you from the charming, yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. But this time around, I'm sitting at the bar in the Hotel Grand Pacific at the Victoria Whiskey Festival in Victoria, British Columbia. I'm Mark Gillespie, reminding you that when you drink, please drink responsibly. Thanks for listening.